Good evening. It's 6 p.m. on Wednesday. We are at Jesus is Lord Ministries International, and we have an open Bible teaching and preaching of Jesus Christ every Wednesday at 6. And once again, I say open because the, the flock is, belongs to the shepherd with a capital S. And uh, we don't have a membership here. People come, they get fed, the, the whole counsel of God. We looked at that scripture last week. So I, I'm, I repeat this week after week. Um, in faith, expecting uh, that spirit to be broken off the body of Christ that says, I'm guilty, uh, I need to be loyal to this one pastor, and, and I have to stay here at this church no matter what. Um, I'm here at Jesus is Lord Ministries because this is where God sent me. <laughs> I'm going to repeat, I am here because this is where God led me and this is where I am supposed to be. Regardless of what every day may look like, I have peace because I know in my heart that I am where I am supposed to be physically to grow in Christ. And we're, So we're going to continue on this. I'm going to open in prayer, and then I'm going to, uh, we're going to start to look, and I'm going to give you a little review, but what I'm going to do this evening, and what the Lord put on my heart this week, was to share my testimony with you, because the title of the message last week was, This is a Hard Saying, Who Can Hear It? That didn't mean these people could hear it, couldn't hear it. They didn't want to. There's a difference. They didn't want to when they turned away from Jesus Christ. So as I'm up here preaching and teaching, and I, I'm commanded by God, we all are if we're a minister of the gospel, to preach the whole counsel of God, the severity of God and the goodness of God, uh, I heard the Lord tell, tell me this week, you're going to give one of your testimonies today because as you're giving this lesson, which most people are not going to want to hear it because it's dealing with sin, the sin in their hearts, the choices that they make, uh, you're going to give your testimony um, so that people are not going to look at you like, well, who does Pastor Pete think he is looking down his nose at me? And I'm certainly not doing that. The messages are for me. They're for my growth, and I get to share them. But I have flesh, just like you do. We have an enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. But I am an overcomer in Christ, and that's important. And we'll talk about we're getting into some heavy-duty stuff here that most people don't want to, to hear about. And when you do talk about it and expound on it, it'll clear a church out quickly. Because the flesh says, Ooh, I, I don't want to hear that. So that's what we're going to do tonight. And like I said, we're going to continue along these lines. We'll have a little bit of a review if you haven't watched from last week, these we live stream all of our services here. This Wednesday night gets put up on our YouTube channel. Uh, Wednesday, uh, Friday, Saturday, and then I copy it, share it into my Facebook page, Peter Yanata, and then also Jesus is Lord Ministries guest speakers page and Preachers of Righteousness page, which is actually the topic that we're talking about, unrighteous behavior and righteous behavior. So let's open in prayer. Father, I thank you that you gave me this message, and it is a hard lesson for people to hear. So I thank you now in advance that you have already plowed the ground for the hearts that you have to watch this message 
that I can say, Father, I gave them the words that you gave me to give to them, and they heard them, they received them, and they believed them because they are the truth, they're the scriptures, the holy scriptures, and that's what we're talking about, righteousness, holiness, and ungodliness. So I thank you for doing that. And as I open my mouth and speak forth the scriptures, the truth that you gave me to speak to your flock, I ask that as these words go out, that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, moves on these scriptures and as we hear them with our ears that our ears are wide open to receive the truth and that you've already softened all of our hearts to receive these messages over the next few weeks because the message is a call to repentance and I know that your words will not fail so I thank you now and I ask Father I submit to you tonight, let these words be your words that come forth, and I move aside, and I say, Holy Spirit, Spirit of Truth, have your way, fill my mouth with the words that need to go forth for people to, people to want to change after the likeness of righteousness because souls are at stake it's serious business lord and i thank you because this message is not my message it's yours so i know it will accomplish that which you send it forth to accomplish through one of your servants and i pray in jesus name amen last week's message was titled, This is a Hard Saying, Who Can Hear It? And because of that, the opening of the message was a series of what I called foundational scriptures. And where I got inspired from that was our foundation is in the truth or the Word of God and Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the Word. Capital W-O-R-D. And he is the truth. We are looking at the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Galatians, or you could say to the churches in Galatia, chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. And there's two parts of this. There's what Paul penned by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which means is evident, which are these, and that would be verses 19 to 21. And then it goes on, but the fruit of the Spirit, or the workmanship in Christ, you could say, would be verses 22 to 23. So we have nine components to the, the fruit of the Spirit and we've talked about this in the past. You have to look at the wording that God uses. Fruit is, is the singular tense. So these nine fruit of the Spirit, as they are manifest, it's one, one fruit that, that is made up of nine parts. So for you to be complete or mature, in Christ, you should be exhibiting, or we all should be exhibiting, all nine of these personality traits of the person of Christ. So how do we look? How do we look? We have the image of God, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God did it in verse 27. And now he is going to take us, those that had ears to hear and a heart to receive, 
those that heard the words that the Father gave to Jesus and believed them. And believed them. So we're born in the flesh, we're born in sin, and we have to be reborn, and that would be reborn in the Spirit, reborn in the image of Christ Jesus. And we need knowledge of Jesus to do that. And this is eternal life. That they know you, he's talking, Jesus is talking to his Father, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. The Word, the truth. Now the very first evidence or manifestation of and what, what we're looking at is sin. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And these are the things we said that in the book of Jeremiah we had to root out of our hearts. So we're going to be looking at 17 different sin behaviors. And when we are partaking of this rotten fruit in our lives, when it's manifest or that evidence is in us, God said you'll not enter into the kingdom of God. So where our culture or the world would say, well, certainly everybody goes to heaven, God is love, and, and you know that person was a really good person. I could be a very good person in the eyes of my culture, and yet in the eyes of God, I can be an abomination because of some of these behaviors. And yet, you can take somebody that is partaking in every one of these rotten fruit, just like the thief on the cross, and seconds maybe minutes before he goes off into eternity, he acknowledges who Jesus Christ is and he's with Christ today in that paradise of heaven. So if I took two different generic personality types, I'll call them, and I would give them to most people and say, if these two people died today, which one would go to heaven? they're probably going to pick the one that resembles who they think they look like. And in themselves, they're going to say, well, I'm a good person. You know, I helped the old lady across the street when I was a Cub Scout. I cut the neighbor's lawn. I did, I did good things. Well, we're learning that the workmanship is not works that we go do. It's the evidence of the workmanship of God working in us to bring us after His likeness which we see in Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we looked at last week synonyms or similar words for sin. And the reason for that was it was a very wide open generic overview for what we're going to go into today. We're going to start to look at what we will call the rotten fruit, the fruit that's going to keep you out of heaven. Your fruit that would be bad fruit, unrighteous fruit, ungodly fruit, and God uses the word wicked to describe these people. God, there's only two people groups in the eyes of God and in His recorded holy words. There's the wicked and there's the righteous. And God said, be holy for I am holy. He's holy. Let us make man in our image. He's got to conform us. 
He's going to. He cannot go against his own word. He swore by himself. There's none higher. I would encourage you to go back and look at last week's message because I could spend all night reviewing that, and, and I'm not going to. Uh, that's not what tonight's message is. So please go back and take a look at last week's message. This is a hard, <laughs> a hard saying. Who can hear it? And that's what we're continuing on. So we're going to take a look at one of these sins tonight. I thought we would get through more than that, but when I was looking at it and, and uh, the Lord opened up the understanding of my mind to His Scriptures, which He always does because I ask Him to, that first sin is adultery. And we could spend several weeks on that. So before I get into that, I'm going to give you the testimony of Peter William Paul Yanata. So I was born in northern New Jersey. My father, my dad's name, my dad, his name is Elpedio. We're from Italian descent. Uh, and Mildred Giannata. I was born in 1956. I was raised for 18 years in the Catholic Church, and I left home, and I, I walked away from the church like many people do when they leave home. Now, along the way, most of my family stopped going to church because there were things that were going on that they would tell me in confidence later on happened between leadership in the church uh, and my dad's dad, my grandfather, and then my dad and my mom. But there was something in them that drove them, regardless of the fact that they wouldn't step church foot in a, in a building in a church that had uh, tainted leadership in it, spoiled spoiled fruit leading it they still felt compelled to have me go to church so i had to walk to church several miles i never had been really taught who jesus christ is and i did not if i did hear the gospel message i i i don't recall that I never responded. But I remember being in the church, even as a little boy, and it felt like a holy place. And as I looked at the stained glass windows, in retrospect, what the Lord showed me several years ago was I was looking at the gospel message in pictures. And remember, the world would say a picture tells a thousand words. So there was something in me that was a desire to know who Jesus was. And that's, that's important to remember in my testimony. So I'm raised to be an independent person. I become successful in business management. Uh, I get hired by several companies. I'm a vice president to do what's called new business development. It's to go into a new area and open up a new branch of a business. So I would do my own marketing my own sales, my own estimating, and then uh, I would go out on construction sites and bring our crews in, the crews that I knew would work the best with that client. And then as they got used to working together, I would wean myself away, and then I would go into the next county and do that. So I'm raising money. And I... I, I raised money three times in my life, and I squandered it. So over the course of my life, I am becoming more and more positioned to be the prodigal son that, that's recorded in the Holy Bible. The parable, or the example of the prodigal son is going to become me. And there's a certain people group I'm not going to name who they are, uh, but I was hurt by them. 
So I spent time similar to the way that Paul had a zeal after Christians, that I, in God's eyes, persecuted this group of people that hurt me. And as I'm doing that, my marriage fell apart. I started to have, um, I became weary in life, I'll just say that. And I turned to alcohol. I drank hard alcohol because I would get full on beer and, and I wanted to, to just annihilate myself every night when I came home. I'd go out to persecute a certain group of people and then I would drink myself. And then I got to the point where I wound up in the bankruptcy court. I had no money because I spent 10 years of my life literally being the prodigal son. I spent it all on the things that the prodigal son in the Bible did. And along the way, I not only got, I, I can't say I was addicted to pornography, but I didn't want anything to do with women. And I could actually say it got so bad that I looked forward to it. So you could almost say I loved it. And then one day I got myself in a position where I, I didn't want anything to do with life anymore. So I continued to drink. I isolated myself from, from most people. And I got into a place where I really didn't care anymore. I didn't want to, life didn't mean anything to me anymore. And I actually went out one night and I, I wanted to drive my car. I went down on a highway and I was looking for uh, a, a, a fast moving tractor trailer because I just wanted to be done. And there was one coming my way and something inside me said, don't do that. And I started to think about is hell real but it wasn't that so much as I knew that my own life had been battered at that point and my children had to grow up in a in a in a broken home and I thought to myself as I saw the headlights in the distance if I do this that person's life is going to become like mine and I can't do I don't want to do that to them so several years had gone by and I needed to know if God was real because there were some consequences that were going to happen that were going to be devastating on some things that I had done. So I went out driving one day. It's pouring rain. It's in the, it's in the summertime. It's, it's, in, uh, it's around May. So we're having spring rains. And it's a very dark day. It's cloudy, the sky's full of clouds, and it's actually pouring rain. And I'm driving and I'm thinking to myself, where can I go to talk to see if God's real? And I wound up at the, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where I live, I wound up at what's called the Gettysburg Outlets because I remember some pretty heavy woods that surrounded that on the on the back end of that uh, those outlet shops 
And as I drove in the parking lot, I looked over to the left of where the movie theater was, and the parking lot was at one level, and then the grade dropped off significantly down into woods. So it's in an area that when it rains hard, it's going to fill up with water. It's like a bowl. And I walk down in there, and it's it literally thunder and lightning. And it's dark, and it's in, the, it's, it's in the morning. Late morning, it shouldn't be like that. So I got down in the woods, and I started to cry out to God. And I forgot this part of my testimony until this week. Because we're talking about knowledge of God through knowledge of Christ. And I remembered this week... God reminded me what I actually cried out to. Not just if He was real, but in my heart, I cried out to Him to know Jesus Christ. And I forgot about that, but God reminded me. So I am on my knees in the mud, in the woods, and lightning's cracking all around me thunder and lightning it, 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 it's it, you could use this as a backdrop for a movie a hollywood movie and i remember on my knees and i started to weep and i just said god i have to know if you're real i need to know you i need to know who you are I need to know Jesus. I always wanted to know Jesus and nobody would tell me. Now think about that. I'm 57 years old at this point and nobody would talk to me about Jesus. Nobody gave the Gospel to me. I had to go to God directly myself. But what happened was He came. I had an encounter with Jesus Christ in the woods that day. So I had no idea where that was going to lead. But last week as I listened to the message, I remembered saying we need a revelation of who Jesus was and that's what led to this. The Lord said, that's what you asked me for, son. So he shows up. Now when you have an encounter with the living God, with Christ, he now immediately becomes real to you. And several weeks had gone by and he led me into to a church where I would meet a discipleship pastor who was also the missionary coordinator. And I had no idea how I was going to fit into the church. I mean, at that point in my life, I was pretty much a brawler. I would wear uh, pink dress shirts at night and go into the seediest looking bar I could find and just wait for somebody to come up to me and say something uh, that I could take him out back and, and uh, you know, do what, do what was on my heart to do. And, and I did that. And um, But I wanted to know Jesus. And he, he came. I had an encounter with him, a physical encounter with it. So for me, all of a sudden, I never read the Bible. I didn't know how to pray. But Jesus Christ was real. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That would become a scripture later on, years later, that I would, I would rest on. Because the Word of God became real to me because Jesus showed up. And I had two more encounters with Him after I gave my heart to Christ. The first time, 
I came back from a church service. Remember the cry, I need to know who you are, Jesus. So I would go to a church where there wasn't a very long sermon, but I would hear things that drove me to the Bible, and I would spend all day Sunday buried in the Word of God. And the more that I read, the hungrier I got. So I was living proof at that time of those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. We looked at that scripture last week. Jesus Christ is the Lord of righteousness. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I finally had peace in my life. I was always like a, a round peg and trying to go in a square hole. And nothing ever made sense until I gave my heart to Christ. I had no idea what that was going to lead to, but all of a sudden there was a peace upon me that I never had in my life before. And I didn't care where it took me because I knew that I saw Christ. He actually answered me. So I heard something in a service. I don't remember what it was, but I got home and, and I, I, I didn't really learn how to meditate on God's Word and, and Him until I got to Jesus' Lord Ministries. But I was doing it in some way that day and I got, I got to a place spiritually where the presence of God was so thick in my apartment, I fell down on my knees and I wept. I had my arms out, my head down, because I was in a, I, I was, a, I was, I was in, I was among something that was holy. And as I wept in the glory of God, and I didn't know what that was at the time. I wept uncontrollably and I travailed. And while I was on my knees, a hand was placed on my shoulder and it startled me. And I couldn't look at it, but I felt it. I couldn't turn around and look. And I remember thinking, it's not a muscle spasm, it's not a pain, it's not a pinched nerve. And I was going through in my mind in the natural, basically avoiding the, the reality of what I already knew in my heart it was. And then I said, Jesus, is that you? And he, he squeezed my shoulder gently. And it, it brought me to a broken place. I thought, w why me? Why, why are you showing up? What is it about me that, that you're coming to? So I... I'm at this church and I took a new believers class and that's where I got connected to the discipleship pastor. And I, I, I remember taking that class, it was only three weeks, and I, I read the, I started to devour the Bible. And I remember telling that pastor when I finished the third week. Now, I'm only two months into the church. A and I went up to him. His name was uh, Pastor Lance Stoddard. A and I said, Pastor Lance, I, I said, as soon as I, I, I you know, the, the leadership in the church, I don't know how any of this works. I need to teach this. And I, I said, I, I need to teach people about Jesus. <laughs> Nobody did this for me. So it was pretty, pretty early. 
when I was allowed to do that. Now, typically we wouldn't want to put somebody to do something like that. Um, they prayed about it. Lance said that, that we needed to, to do this. Uh, and the book, it was a booklet, a, an organized outline form. So what I was really being was a facilitator through scriptures. And um, they allowed me to do that. And I was passionate. I had a blackboard in this classroom and, and I'd be up there drawing pictures and, and uh, it was just the passion, a love of Christ coming out of me and people would be giving their hearts in, <laughs> in the class. <laughs> I remember these two women argued with me for three weeks. They came from a denomination and they didn't believe some of the things that a Pentecostal Christian would believe. And it wasn't, I, I looked at them and they didn't argue with me to have an argument. They just wanted the truth. And I remember at the end of the class, the one woman hugged me and said, I really love this class because no matter who asks you a question, you don't let us leave until we understand the answer. You don't just give it to us, but you walk us through it till we understand it. Well, I never had that with, with anybody in my life. And I thought, if you just let me learn who you are, Jesus, I will tell everybody about you. So my initial cry out was to know Christ. Now, he delivered me from one of these things that we're getting ready to talk about. It was a, a, a miraculous thing. And one of the words we're going to look at over the next two nights is backslidden. Um, I didn't realize that word was actually in the Bible. It's in Jeremiah. And so I backslid a little bit and I went back into this behavior. Uh, one of these, the, the manifest or the evidence of the works of the flesh. And I cried out to God and He delivered me another time. He took it from me. A couple years had gone by and, and, and I started thinking about it one day and I heard the Lord say, I took that from you twice. And if you do that again, I'm going to leave you to that. Now I heard Him tell me that. Remember the encounter in the woods the hand on my shoulder so Jesus Christ is real. And now more and more the fear of God is coming into me. That reverence fear we talked about. And right at that point, I went to, I got invited to go to a prayer meeting. It was in Littlestown, Pennsylvania in a barn. And there was a woman that got inspired to do this. Uh, we would come in there. She would give a little, a little talk about what she felt the Lord was telling her that she should pray for the weak. And so she opened this up to other people. And she would walk around and start to pray that theme. And, and people would gather around her uh, kind of in a circle and some of them would start to pray. Uh, and, and, and I felt, I, I, I just felt at a place for, for that night. And, and I thought, I, 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 don't, I didn't know what it was. But I looked off to the side, and there was a life-size, probably not to scale, but maybe in the width and the girth of it, maybe not the height, but there was a life-size uh, I'll call it a life-size cross in the barn. And I looked at it and I got drawn to it. And the closer that I got to this cross, the more I felt the glory of God. And remember, I'm experiencing something and nobody's ever taught me. And I don't know, I, I'm not calling it an anointing. It's God's glory. A and, and I'm having these incredible encounters uh, that I know have to be Him, 
without knowing the words. That's important. <laughs> I had the revelation that Jesus was real and I knew that when He showed up, certain things happened. And there wasn't anybody else that I knew that felt that in my life. They were like deer in a headlight when I would be trying to explain these encounters or things going on. So, I walk up to the cross. By the time I get probably, I'm going to say, maybe six feet away like I am to this cross, I, I, I started to stumble towards it and I fell on my knees. The glory of God was so great at that point on that cross that I just lifted my eyes up, my hands up to heaven, and I looked up to heaven, but I had my eyes closed. But when I opened them on that empty cross, I now saw Jesus hanging there. And I saw the blood, the spikes in his hands and his feet. So that vision that I had stopped me cold in my tracks because I got the revelation of what he did for me. And he was real. He was showing up, physically manifesting himself in the flesh to me that way with a vision. So I would refer to myself as the least of the saints. And I share this tonight because as we get into a message, that's a hard thing to say. The Lord said, I want you to stand up there and I want them to see a regular person. Somebody that I manifested myself to because in their heart they decided that they wanted to know who I was. And you were not born into holiness or into one of these families where, uh, you know, I was around the church. So it took a long time for this to come about, but there was a lot of the world and the flesh in me. There was a lot of Egypt in me. So I looked at this as when I left home till the year that I gave my heart to Jesus, August 4th, 2012, so we're on the eve of my reborn birthday. And when I thought about that this week, that's when the Lord told me to give your testimony. Now, that was 40 years. So when I got and started to read in Exodus that God took His people into the wilderness for 40 years, for them to learn one thing, and this is God's words, I brought you into the wilderness to teach you one thing. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And remember the scriptures we looked at last week. And God spoke. The word was in the bosom of the Father. The word of God is in the innermost intimate part of the Father and yet, when He speaks those words, the Word was made flesh. It's the Word coming out of the heart of the Father that declares the Father. The Word doesn't take the glory for Himself. Father, glorify Me that I may glorify You. I must be about My Father's business. Father, I did what You sent Me to do. Now glorify Me that I may glorify You. In Jesus' heart, it was always about the Father. He referred to the Father as greater than He, and He understood that authority. So He submitted Himself to the Father wholly. And that's, that's what we all need to do. So I was in the wilderness for 40 years. 
but I didn't die there. I almost did. The first generation died in the wilderness. By God's grace and through His love, He kept me from doing things that if I ended my life then, I'd be in, in hell for eternity. And then He showed up and He was real. And He continues to do that every day. But the reason is not because I'm special. I'm being a doer of God's Word. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. That scripture is in my heart. I believe it. And when I do it, God sits with me every day. And he talks to me in a calm voice. And what is he using? All scripture is given by inspiration of God for doctrine, for reproof, conviction, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So I can't say to you, that God sat with me and said, Peter, you're one of my favorites. I love you so much. You're so special. No, He uses His Word in a loving voice to correct me, to rebuke me, and to give me instruction in righteousness. And those Scriptures are profitable for that. Now, I was looking in the book of Jeremiah today, and, and Jer- God spoke pretty sternly to the pastors and the prophets <laughs> through Jeremiah. In fact, he talks about how the prophets are giving bad information and they're leading the flock basically into hell. But he says what they're speaking has no profit in it. Think about that. A prophet, somebody that thinks they're a prophet of God, what are they speaking? Because I saw that scripture today and the same sentence that spoke about the prophets said what they were speaking had no profit. And I thought, wow. And I remembered last week saying, When you speak about prophets or apostles, you're always going to refer to them as a true apostle or a true prophet because I'm using the examples of who these people were as defined by God in the Bible. So we looked at Jeremiah last week and we looked at Apostle Paul. So has has Peter Yanada arrived? No. Does God manifest himself to me yes every day and he leads me ever closer after his likeness because that's what i seek seek ye first the kingdom of god am i blessed yes i would say i have god's favor on me not because i'm his special person because i'm a doer of the word So as I grow in maturity and stature like Jesus, it says in Luke chapter 2, at the end of that chapter, when, when Jesus left, submitted, He grew in stature and maturity, but He grew in the favor of God and the favor of man. When the Lord showed me that, I asked him one time, God, I don't deserve your favor. Why do I feel, I, I, I feel like I have your favor on me? And initially he said, it's because you believe in your heart that you don't deserve it. That's humility, son. You acknowledge 
the condition that you're in and you always have since I manifested myself to you. But then he showed me that scripture. So God doesn't always speak to me everything at once. He leads me step by step by step. And how does he do that? Precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Now there's been some things that are pretty heavy duty, I'll call them, that I had to repent of. And when I got to the place in my heart where I truly was repenting, when I got to a true place of repentance, when that happened, God showed me some things. Uh, one of them, for example, was I had to learn how to forgive a, a, a person in my past. It wasn't until after I did that and I came to a place of repentance towards this person and this people group that God showed me that, that I had just an equal, as an equal part in that. And actually, I was the one that triggered the whole downslide of this relationship. Other things existed, and I looked at them, and I convinced myself that certain things happened in the order uh, because your flesh and your imagination can do that, which is one of these things we're going to look at over the next couple weeks. But the fact of the matter is, God said, no, you, you did this first. You initiated it. But He didn't tell me that until I was at a place in my heart where I could receive that. And when I did, I contacted this person and I apologized for hurting them. I didn't ask them to forgive me. I just said to them, I was wrong and I did you wrong and I'm sorry. And I said, I, I've given my heart to Jesus. I'm reborn. And that's not an excuse, but I saw the truth after I did that. So in reality, there was a testimony of Christ. It wasn't me. It was God that brought me to that place. So sin and repentance. We are going to take a look moving forward in the book of Galatians. Paul's letter to the church as the apostolic leader of the church where he addresses now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. And like I said last week, these are the things to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. That's from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. I gave you the wrong chapter and verse last time. <laughs> For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So there's another and to pull down. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against what? Against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And this is eternal life, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the One that sent Me. So we're going to look at the Bible. Strong's exhaustive concordance. We're gonna. I'm, I use the King James Bible. When I started to learn how to memorize and meditate scriptures, the scriptures in the books that Pastor Mike wrote, because he used the King James version uh, when he got gave his heart to Christ at age 19, and he's the same age as me. They're all in the King James. So I I, I used to think. 
that I couldn't read the King James. It was a foreign language. But because it was the Scripture and God's words will not return void, when I memorized the Scriptures from the book, and they were word for word the Scriptures, and got those Scriptures into my heart, suddenly that stronghold was pulled down. It was a lie. And it made sense to me. So I could go and quote the Scripture in the King James or, or paraphrase it in modern English. <laughs> it was a lie of the devil that I couldn't do that. Um, so we're going to look. The Scriptures I give you are going to be out of the King James Version. We're going to use the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, which is linked to the King James um, these are going to be Hebrew definitions and Greek definitions in those languages that will open up the scriptures, certain words in the scriptures we go through. And then I'm going to use also Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary and what's called thesaurus.com. Uh, a thesaurus would be what we looked at last week when we looked at sin and I said these are synonyms or similar, it's, they're different words with the same definition, and there was over 20 of them. Well, we're getting ready to look at the works of the flesh, which are these, and adultery is the first one that we're going to take a look at. So, in closing, I want to just give you a homework assignment, because I listened to for several hours today, the first 11 chapters in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Now, in context, when I was looking at my notes for the, uh, the epistle to the Galatians, the very first word that we're going to look at is adultery. And that's the Greek word categorized in the concordance. G for Greek, 3430. When I was looking at those definitions, I asked the Lord in prayer this morning to open up my understanding of the Scriptures. I do that every time I read, and I, I'd encourage you uh, to do that because God requires us to have knowledge of him and Christ is the word so I'm asking him for his own will to be done in my life which I pray every day anyway uh, but this was more of a specific thing into my heart and what what I did yesterday when I was meditating I wrote this down by adultery because this question popped into my head, and this is what I wrote. Can the bride commit adultery to the Lamb? Unfaithfulness to the Lamb. So yesterday afternoon, I got downloaded into me and led to Revelation, which is what? The Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 19, verse 1 to 10 where it's revealed to rejoice for the bride has made herself ready. She's been clothed with the wedding garment, white linen, and the garment is the righteousness of saints. In other words, we, we're, we got to look like Christ. And when we do, it's righteousness unto holiness. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 to 14 is a parable about the wedding feast. And then Luke 14, verse 15 to 24, is a parable, but its title, it, it, the wording's a little different. It's the Great Supper, the wording used there. Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13, is another parable, illustration Jesus gave. This is the parable of the, the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. It's talking about being ready for the wedding. And then John chapter 3, verse 22 to 36. 
in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist is going to, in these verses, he's going to exalt Christ. But along the way, towards the end of these verses, he refers to Christ as the Lamb of God. So there's five sets of Scriptures that God showed me when I asked Him that. And then, when I was coming home from Baltimore today, and I said, Lord, I, 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 want a, I need a book for this topic. And I remembered, this, I remembered last week the Scripture where God was using His prophet to rebuke the pastors in the book of Jeremiah for, for not feeding the flock, for abandoning the flock. And so I, I remembered that, and this is how, how God can lead and guide us. So I put the book of Jeremiah on, and I started in chapter 1, and I, I, I in over an hour, listened through uh, that first beginning of that chapter probably five or six times before I let it run on through 11 verses. But what I found when I got home was several things. Um, I looked up the word adultery in the concordance and it's used six times in Jeremiah the book of the prophet, the true prophet, Jeremiah. The word adulterers is used twice and adulteries is used once. So nine times in that one book this word is used. And God is going to use the word backsliding. His people are backsliding nine times. Backslidings four times. So 13 times, he's going to use the word whoredom. And then it led me to the word pastor. And that shows up once in the singular context in Jeremiah and plural pastors seven times. So write these down. This is Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 8, chapter 3, verse 15. Chapter 10, verse 21. Chapter 12, verse 10. Chapter 22, verse 22. And chapter 23, verse 1 and 23, verse 2. That's where, where it was recorded. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. So when we look at the word adultery next week, we're probably going to spend all week, all night, the one hour on that one word because in Jeremiah, God's talking about Israel, His people have been shameless. And it's a call to repentance. He's going to tell them over and over again through the prophet, turn from your wickedness and I will forgive your sins. And as I'm listening to this, What's in the back of my head, which I got in my heart, is if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear in heaven, from heaven, hear them from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. And that's what God is going to talk about in the book of Jeremiah through his prophet. Now, that was in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 7. But this whole book of Jeremiah is addressing the adulterous behavior of God's people towards Him. So, I asked him, when I asked that question yesterday, it was a question, and I was going to ask the body of Christ as a rhetorical question, can the bride... Be adulterous to the Lamb. Well, yes, and we're going to see the depth of that word, what God's definition of adultery is. It actually uh, is also means whoredom, idolatry, and we're going to see that. 
So when we look at adultery, if I would just say for you to give me the definition of that word, you're going to say, well, it's, it's a, if, if a husband or a wife uh, ch- cheats on one another uh, and has a sexual encounter with someone else. Well, that's true. But we are the bride of Christ. And we're, we're going to be married to the Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb. Perfect. And we have to be made holy for that wedding day. We have to wear that white linen garment and that is righteousness. So that is exactly what we were talking about last week. So when I said last week, I mentioned again how God gives me the message for me. I'm asking questions. I'm in a relationship with Him. I I talk to Him. I actually look to where I believe He's at. And I get downloads and He speaks to me. And, and this got opened up all afternoon. That happened. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek God's face. So before I came in here, what I thought I was going to get through most of these definitions, or at least half of them in one hour, that message got changed, but I always pray before I come in here and ask God to take over, <laughs> push me, move me out of the way, and you speak. So all afternoon, he just opened up my understanding. He answered that prayer. So we have to recognize that he is answering prayers. So when I pray, I always thank God for listening to me, for hearing me, and for always answering my prayers. I believe He does. It may look different, and I may not have seen the manifestation of it yet in the natural, but because I've learned through meditating on God's words to pray the Scriptures that are in my heart, I'm actually praying God's own words, and God cannot lie back to Him and asking Him for that which is His will. That's impossible for God to not answer that prayer. That prayer is never going to return void to me. It can't. It can't. It's impossible. And I, I ha- that's in my heart. I got that revelation. As long as I pray the Word of God... It can't fail. It's going to accomplish that which He wants to accomplish in me through His Word. That's an impossibility for that not to happen. That's good news, people. When I pray the will of God through His words, it will happen in Jesus' name. It's impossible for that prayer to not be answered. I mean, that should bring the joy of the Lord to all of us. But I needed to share the the testimony with you so that you could see that there was a, a large part of my life where I was living in darkness. And, and I would say, when, when I look at Genesis and, you know, the, the dark, there, there's darkness and the Spirit of God hovered over the abyss, that was my life. Now, I was a successful business person, and the world would look at me and say, wow, you know, Peter, he's intelligent, he teaches people, he does all these things, but the fact of the matter was, I wasn't saved, and I, would, I was under God's wrath, like we talked about last week. And God worked with me. He was long-suffering. That's one of these workmanship of God in me. He was long-suffering and patient with me. And I got that revelation, so I know that I'm commanded to have be long-suffering and patience and forbearance. Is that easy? No. But every day, God gives me opportunities to bear all others in love with with patience and in love. So He's growing me in my heart to where that is a knee-jerk reaction now. 
Now what comes out of me? The Word of God. I don't quote the, the, the verse, the, 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 the book, the chapter and verse to some people, most people, but it's the Word of God all day through my work day. And in so doing, it opens up opportunities for me to witness. So the more that I'm a doer of God's words, the more doors He opens up. Keep on asking, keep on seeking. Well, what does He want me to ask Him for? Knowledge of God, knowledge of Christ, knowledge of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, God's wisdom. Why? Because I'm a pastor. So what do I do? I look at Solomon. Solomon got wisdom because he said, God, you made me king of these people and I have to govern them, so I want wisdom to do that. And that's what I pray every day. God, you, you, you called me to pastor a flock, to feed the flock, the lambs, the sheep, and I'm asking you for wisdom like Solomon did so that I can fulfill what you want me to do in the first place. <laughs> and he gives me that. Why wouldn't he? So we see these examples of other people in the Bible. It's important for us to look at the context of what they're doing because most of the time we can take that just like I did with Solomon and say, wait a minute, I'm not the king of Israel, but I'm a pastor and I'm called. I know I'm called by God to feed the flock. So I need God's wisdom to do that. And I, and I pray that back. You did it for Solomon, so in my heart, Lord, I need to be able to do what you want me to do in these people's hearts through me. And I want to do that, God. Help me. Help me to love them like you do so I can do this and give me the wisdom to do it. Well, he's, he's never going to not answer that prayer. <laughs> So you always want to ask God to have eyes to see. So I could read that in, 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 in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 13 where Solomon got ready to dedicate the temple in the context of what it is and yet that whole scenario in that book, there's an analogy of what's happening there in Solomon's life that applies to me in my life today. And I see it. So I believe that. And I ask what I ask for. God, this is, this is just like what scenario Solomon was in. It's different, but it's the same thing. You, you've put me to shepherd people in Christ. And I need your wisdom. I want wisdom so I can be successful at that. Because I need to be an ambassador for you. I need to represent you and it needs to be your words and not mine. They need to see you and not me. And that, that, that when I got that revelation two years ago, I was praying at the same time for God to quicken my growth. Well, how's He going to do that? He's, he's doing it divinely through downloads of His Word. <laughs> His words can't fail. They can't return void. So the more I meditate on Him and knowledge of Him, the more knowledge He gives me through His Word. Now next week when we look at this, these, these scriptures from Jeremiah that, that talk about adultery, we're also going to be looking at the word knowledge. It shows up five times in the book of Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15 chapter 4 verse 22 chapter 10 verse 14 chapter 11 verse 18 and chapter 51 verse 17 so we'll see backsliding used with knowledge God is going to say the reason that you're backsliding is you don't know me and woe to you pastors and prophets for not teaching the people the words coming out of you that are of no profit. 
You're not leading them. In fact, that word pastor also means in a, in, a, uh, in a broad sense, friend, like you're not to abandon them. And that, that set of scriptures where it was verse 1 and 2 in chapter 23, remember God said, you scattered my flock and you never went to visit them. You left them out there alone. Jesus told His disciples, I now call you friends because you do what I said. So God turns around and tells those pastors, woe to you, I'm going to bring upon you what you did to them. God's judgment starts in the house of the Lord. It's God's justice, not ours. And I'll close on that. So everything that I saw today has been linked we're going to see adultery because who is it that you are being an adulterer against? It's Jesus. And we're going to see that in the book of Jeremiah and also in the New Testament. Paul will write about that as well. The Word of God, the truth. At the end of the day, we, unrepentant, are adulterers against Jesus Christ who is the express image of God. Which means there's idols in our life. Wooden engraven things that we would have in our life that are we've exalted above the knowledge of God. And we're keeping them there. So yes, this is a hard lesson. Who can hear it? That's the bad news. You're not going to want to hear it. The good news is, is if you can receive the messages, God is going to quicken you. And I'm speaking by the Holy Spirit now. <laughs> You'll be quickened in your growth and you're going to start to experience a quickening of knowledge, your knowledge and understanding of God through His Holy Scriptures. You're going to get that revelation. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear over the next several weeks, God will do that for you. He's done it for me. He's pulled me out of the pig pen. But I had to, I had to get wholeheartedly in my heart to turn around and repent and want to come back to the Father. And He's kept me because I've tried to keep that. And I cry out to Him every day, God, keep me. Help me, keep me. Keep me, Lord. Thank You. Have mercy on me for this and that and the other thing. Keep me, God. Teach me. Teach me Your statutes so I don't sin against You. But that's in my heart. And He honors that because it's coming out of my heart where the Spirit of Christ is. So when I cry those things out, I weep. Because what's happening is, I believe I'm starting to mourn over the condition of myself just like the long-suffering of Christ would do when He looks at me and says, gosh, I wish He would just get a hold of this, me and my Word. And I'll close on that. Or I could be here till the sun comes up. Father, I thank You for, for Your words, Your truth. And Lord, I, uh, from, from the bowels of my heart, I thank You for... for Your love, for Your grace, and Your mercy, for goodness, Your goodness and mercy endures forever. And I thank You for those things because Your wrath also is on us as unrepentant hearts, as we are adulterers towards You. So I, I just pray, Lord, that this message goes out and it has the same effect on every ear that heard it that it had on me. And we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. So now that everybody can look at me and they won't say, oh, who does he think he is? He's holier than now. No, I, 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 that, that they just see a normal person, a man of the flesh that had an encounter with Christ and he doesn't want anything else. And that you honor that, Lord. And that's why 
I don't take it lightly to stand behind here and I know that you'll answer this prayer. And I look forward to all the testimonies that come in when this message goes out over the airways that people will look at that, leaders in the church, and say, you know, that person had the courage to get up and say what he did. But he also said, look what the Lord hath done for me. And that the leadership in the church comes to a place of repentance so that the land is not defiled like you talk about in the book of Jeremiah. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus. And I thank you. Amen.